من هاتوه أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحدينا وفيه محموم إلا وفرج الله همه ولا مغموم إلا وكشف الله غمه ولا طالب حاجة حاجة إلا وقضى الله حاجته فقال علي عليه السلام Many men have claimed greatness throughout the ages. Many, Many men have claimed greatness throughout the ages. Many, Many men and women have passed through changing faces. faces. Many men and women have passed through times changing ancient, faces. Mankind has faces. craved guidance in Since all races. Since times of ancient, they look up to the Lord to deliver the message. All races. Then kill the messengers. They look up to the Lord to deliver the message. Then how long will they? How long will we kill our prophets? How long, will they kill, how long will we kill our prophets? Bob Marley men of said piety. it blatantly. Taught themselves and families and their men of piety. A handful were chosen to represent nations and relate recitations. A handful were chosen one was to represent selected nations as the seal of all and relate recitations. I won't take one too was much selected time. as the seal it. of all prophets. I'm talking about Muhammad. I won't take Dan too much Herodot, time. Adam, 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 Noah, Moses. I'm talking about most Muhammad. Most minds don't know Dan this. Dan the truth is found in holy pages, so we neglect it. Most minds don't know this. Now it's banging into your found in holy pages, so we neglect it. The Creator guides the patient one from his creation. can't escape it. But we can't shut our eyes if it's the light that we're chasing. All tongues need to praise him. We can't shut our eyes if it's the light that we're chasing. Enlighten the haters. All tongues need to praise him. Educate the faith. Muhammad. Enlighten the haters. The blessing of the All hearts should embrace him. Now keep your third eye open. Put the practice and stop the hoping. Now keep your third eye open. Put the practice and stop the hoping. I'm Roman. My inner is like the destruction of the Romans. I'm going back to Medina and high without the smoke for an omen. Not joking, I'm going back to Medina and getting high without the smoke here. If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses is not joking, then why can't you believe that too? If Moses even all his enemies five established the League of Justice. Never lusted. Even all his enemies were for gain. Conveyed to his never lusted. Nor had thirst of his name. Gain. Unlettered, not illiterate. Don't tell me you couldn't read. He was taught Unlettered, by Allah. Unlettered, not illiterate. That's all Don't tell me you couldn't read. And his he was father and his father's father worshipped only one. Direct and his father and his father's father worshipped only one. Splitting atoms with his knowledge, straight back to revelation. Closing atoms to be alone in isolation. The revelation. Soul awakened Climbing every day and found be alone in isolation. Gabriel Soul awakened had every day and found meditation. Time to let Gabriel mankind be free since Jesus' ascension. Time to let mankind be free since Jesus' ascension. Shun away, shun away the evil thoughts, be free, free emancipate them. them. Muhammad shun away the evil thoughts, be free, free emancipate them. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One day, walking with his uncle Abu Talib as a youngster, a monk had spotted One day, him walking with his uncle Abu Talib as a youngster, checked the seal on his back and spotted him and told him to come closer. Checked the seal on his back and insisted it was an oracle. According to his books, it showed signs of a righteous individual. According to his books, it showed signs of a righteous individual. As Muhammad was approaching, a miracle. According to his books, it showed signs of a righteous individual. As Muhammad was approaching, a miracle. He said he saw the trees prostrating. He recognized the messenger and immediately he knew. Now how can some people say that? He recognized the messenger and immediately he knew. Till the age of forty, he suddenly became a prophet. No, his Until light even around even before suddenly Hades became a prophet. No, I'll comment his on light the night been that around he even to the heaven. Hades comment was taken there by. I'll Barat. comment on the night that he ascended to the heaven. Was taken first there by. First up was Alexa, Barat. situated in the promised land. land. Upwards in first up was Alexa, situated in the promised land. Upwards in upwards in the journey he met with Jesus, Moses, Abraham. Following the greeted them and saluted them, which common language, all in hand. 
Following the, the company of angels, he ascended higher. higher. We all understand. Conversing with past messengers. In the company of angels, Messiah. he ascended higher. The highest point he reached with past two bold lengths away Messiah. to the one that the shaped and molded us by utilizing the clay. By utilizing to the one that shaped and molded us by utilizing, I utilizing get to meet him by utilizing clay. I pray. I get to meet him. Before we begin, if everyone could just move uh, closer to the front. Before we begin, if everyone uh, please mute move your cell phones. Uh, closer to the front. Or Muhammad Wa'ad and Muhammad Salawat. Please mute your cell phones. Or Muhammad Wa'ad and Muhammad Salawat. When we take a look at the different political theories throughout when history, we take a look at the different we find that often there is a great history. deal of discussion we in find regards that often to the there role is a great deal of, a subject of discussion in a particular in nation regards to the role and his responsibility in a particular in nation regards to the government and his responsibility in regards to the government. We take a look for example, the Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx. Go ahead and we take a look for anyone who has studied Manifesto of Karl Marx or psychology or sociology or these types of subjects or psychology or sociology or these types of subjects. The Communist Manifesto. Many of them may have come in across Karl this work, Marx, the Communist he Manifesto. In it, that the human being, in it, Karl Marx, within a particular he nation, that the human being should marginalize his own within a particular nation and his own material should marginalize benefits and his own desires for the sake of the own material government. Benefits and wants. The idea is the that of the, the human being he marginalizes the idea himself is that in the name the human of the government. Being he marginalizes what I wish to do in the name of the government. My state, you know, you know marginalize my own provision for the sake my, of the state. You know, you know marginalize my go own provision for the sake of the state. At another example, that of a scholar by the name of Jean Jacques Rousseau. At another example, 
that this of a scholar by the name of Jean-Jacques in his text Rousseau. Called the social this contract. particular scholar writes in, in his he text states that it is not called the, the social contract of the human in being states that or of the subject of a particular nation of to marginalize being, anything or of the subject of a particular nation to marginalize anything of the leader of but the rather government it, the government itself to provide to mold itself around the wants and around the desires of the people within that particular community you go ahead and we take a look at the religion of Islam for when we take a look at Islamic political theory an Islamic economic and social theory, we find that our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam desired moderation between the two sides. The goal of Rasulullah's political theory was not only to marginalize one group of people or marginalize the government over the group of people, but rather his idea the concept revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was in the form of moderation. That when we talk about moderation, we're speaking about the rights of the people must be preserved. But at the same time, the people within that community, they must also be willing to sacrifice a couple of things for the sake and for the benefit of the entire general welfare. We take a look and we take a look at some of these particular sacrifices that human beings make. We find that in our fiqh, we are told, for example, to pay khums and to pay zakat, amongst many other things. And we see that the reform that our Holy Prophet ﷺ had established was in threefold. The first fold of this reformation is what is known as political reformation. Rasulullah comes, and as we mentioned the other day, he came to a society where war was taking place at each and every corner. We mentioned these groups, the two tribes called the Aus and the Khazraj. For 300 years, they had been battling it out. Can you imagine the number of deaths that take place in a battle over 300 years? An uncountable number. Which is why that it is stated that, that Rasulullah, when he comes and he establishes peace between these two particular groups, these two particular tribes, his first step and his greatest accomplishment, according to his own words, was that the fact that he stopped this bloodshed from, overcurring, oh, from, 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 from occurring, and secondly, that he formed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Secondly, we go and we continue, and we see amongst the other political reformations of the Holy Prophet was that in regard to these battles that were taking place, that Rasulullah, by virtue of the Holy Quran, he stopped in four months that no battles were allowed to take place. Thus, no bloodshed were allowed to take place in these four, known as the sacred months. What months are they? They are the months of Rajab, and Dhul Qa'da, and Dhul Hajjah, and the month of Muharram. That even those Arabs in Jahiliyyah who were fighting for 300 years, they stopped fighting in these four months. But those Banu Umayyah, they came and they killed Aba Abdullah in which month? The month of Muharram. Anyhow, we go ahead and we take a look at the next type of reform which the Holy Prophet established. After political reform, Rasulullah established what is known as economic reform. Economic reform, we take a look at the different economic systems in the world and we see the economic system of Rasulullah. That at the helm of this, as we mentioned, is homes and there's zakat. When this money is given to the leader of the community, the Imam or the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or today the representative of the Imam in the marja of our choice, we go ahead and we see what? We see that they distribute the money for what? They distribute it in the name of Islam. They distribute it for the sake of scholarship, for the sake of education, for the sake of medicine, for the sake of orphans, for the sake of widows, and so on and so forth. Which is why one of the most important reforms is this notion of the public treasury or al baytul mal. We go ahead and we see that the Imams of the Ahl al Bayt, that Rasulullah and Amir al Mu'mineen, they were very, very strict when it came to the expenses that were, that, that were paid out of the baytul mal or the public treasury. That each and every individual, as long as they were able to provide for themselves, after they paid their dues, they would also receive a certain tax which they were able to use for their own benefit. At the same time, we see that during the Khalafa, of, during, the, during the political leadership of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in 13 years in Medina, and the four years and nine months of political leadership 
of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib in Kufa, we find that with the exception of these two political rulerships, we find that no one could ever claim that economic justice took place anywhere across the world. Anywhere. The stress that was placed by Amir al-Mu'mineen and the stress that was placed by Ali ibn Abi Talib and of Rasulullah and of Ahl al-Bayt is, is unmatched. Which is why one day we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen is walking in the streets of Kufa. It is stated, traditions and historians, they write, that Ali ibn Abi Talib, every single day, in the heat of, of, of Iraq, and if any of you have been to Iraq these days, in the time of summer, for example, in the 15th of Sha'aban, in the months of June, July, August, you will know exactly what it means to say that my head is about to explode. Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wasalam, would walk in this intense heat, and he would walk looking for anyone who needed even a piece of bread. He would walk and look and seek anyone until it is stated that one day he was walking and all of a sudden he saw one Christian man sitting outside of the public treasure. It said that this man was blind, this man was old. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he goes to him and he says, is everything okay? What is your name? He inquires about him. After that, he finds out that this man has no wealth. He has nothing. It is stated that Ali ibn Abi Talib, he sits down in the heat of Kufa and he begins to weep and he begins to cry. And he says, he begins to call all of his ministers and all of those working in his government. And he says, Mahada. He says, what is this? He didn't say Menhada, he didn't say who is this? He says, Mahada, what is this? What situation have we come to that there is one poor man sitting in the street? If you take a look today, that we have poor people in our own communities, and which one of us, forget about weeping, which one of us even inquires about those people and looks and asks and seeks about their problems. No, we don't care. Which is why we go ahead and we see that the first step of economic reformation in regards to the khalafa, in regards to the political leadership of the Holy Prophet is in regards to this, in regards to this concept of the, of the public treasury. Secondly, we see another type of economic reformation. And this is the notion of slavery. Because many times people, they come and they read the books of history and the ahadith of Ahl al-Bayt, and we see that the imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, they kept slaves in their homes. And if the imams of Ahl al-Bayt were the champions of justice, then why were they individuals who kept slaves in their home? We go in and we take a look at this concept of slavery very briefly. We see specifically in regards to the imamate of Imam Zainul al-Abideen, alayhi salatu wasalam. For when people want to attack the school of the Ahl al-Bayt, often they will go to the period of history in regards to the life of Imam Zain al-Abideen and they will state, look how many slaves were in the house of the fourth Imam, Imam al-Sajjah. We take a look and we see that during the life of the fourth Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, that the political situation, the economic situation was so awful that the battle of Karbala has just taken place. Thus number one, people don't even believe in religion anymore. Situation. Political situation, historical circumstances suggest that the fabric of society had completely been removed because of the political leadership of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. We go ahead and we see that the economic system during the time of Jahiliyyah, before the time of Rasulullah, was such that they would always keep slaves in their home. And slaves had absolutely no rights. Thus we come and we see Imam Zainul Abideen number one in his Ar-Rasalat al-Hukuq, the treaties of rights, he has a section in regards to the right of slaves. He says that the slaves, if we truly translate the word slave from the abd that was used in the Arabic language, we translate it literally as slave. And slave in our English language has a negative connotation. Those who came from Africa in the 13, 1400s were abused, were working in the cotton farms and so on and so forth, but rather they were treated as servants. And not only that, Imam al-Sajjad in al-Rasanat al-Hukuq speaks about the rights of the slave, saying that they should wear the same clothes as you wear. They should have the same living accommodations as the master have. They should eat the same food. They should wear the same clothes. They should do everything and they should live exactly like they are your equal. Number two, we also see that if we take a look at slavery in the context of American history, we know that after Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation in the mid-1860s, what happens? That the slaves are freed after the Civil War, and what happens? Immediately after that, once they're freed, where do they go? What happened? 
everyone knows who studied in this country, that they came back and they walked and they knocked the door of their master and they said, look, we have no place to go. We want to work for you again. They had become institutionalized. Which is why when we go to the life of Imam al-Sajjad, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu wasalam, keeps slaves in his home to do what? To train them in education and in economy. And so they are able to go out into the workforce and are able to contribute to society. Imam Zainul Abidin trains thousands of slaves according to traditions in the idea that they can go back and contribute. Not so that they become institutionalized till they come back to his home. They were trained in many of these particular individuals who were under the hand of Imam al-Sajjad turned out to be great ulama and great scholars and great narrators of our ahadith and many of our traditions and rulings of fiqh and jurisprudence come from these students and from these slaves of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu wasalam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Thirdly, and, post, and, and, and perhaps most importantly, in regards to the revolutions or the reformations of Rasulullah, we discuss social reformation. That if we take a look at Rasulullah wasallam situation, we find that his revolution socially was of the utmost importance. That Rasulullah, he gave rights to women and gave rights to children and, and spoke about the importance of education. We know, for example, in regards to women, that the first martyr in the, in the history of Islam is Sumayya, the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir. She converts to the religion of Islam because Ammar ibn Yasir tells her, Oh my mother, the religion of Rasulullah preaches that no woman should be buried alive. Look at the situation of the people at the time, we all know. Sumayya says that if the religion of your prophet Muhammad says that women are no longer to be buried alive, then I wish to follow this religion. We go ahead and we see that the, ref the, the, the reform in regards to education. That if we take a look at the history of Mecca during that time of Rasulullah, how many people learned how to read and write? Just a handful. And now go ahead and take a look in the books of our ahadith. For example, in Al-Kafi or an, in Al-Bihar al-Anwar. Any book of ahadith of Ahl al-Bayt, Basa'ar al-Darajat, each and every one of these books of rawayat and traditions of Ahl al-Bayt. You open up the first page and they will be pages upon pages upon pages and chapters speaking about what? About the fada and about the importance and about the merits of education. The most important thing in, the, in our books of Ahadi and our books of Rawayat are stressing on education of every man and of every woman regardless of age, regardless of denomination, regardless of culture. Which is why we go in and we see that after the battle of Badr, in which Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam killed 35 of the 70 amongst the opponents who were killed on the, on, on the day of Badr, Rasulullah captured, captured some prisoners of war. They were brought toward Rasulullah and Rasulullah said this. He says that you prisoners of war, I am not going to punish you. And if you go, if you go ahead and you read the history of how they were treated, you will certainly benefit from the akhlaq of Rasulullah. But the important thing is that Rasulullah stated to each and every one of them, that if you teach 10 Muslims how to read and write, then you will be free. That's it. Nothing else. You don't have to pay a fine. Nothing. The only thing that you have to do is teach 10 Muslims how to read and write. And then he said that if you cannot do that, but you are wealthy, you can pay a fine, which I will distribute to the poor, Rasulullah said. And if you cannot teach 10 Muslims how to read and write, and if you cannot pay this fine, then the only thing you have to do is forgive I ask, ask me for forgiveness and you are free to go. Look at the akhlaq of Rasulullah. Look at the reformation that the Holy Prophet tried to establish. Which is why in this particular verse of the Holy Quran, which is of the utmost importance in regards to the verse, in regards to the surah that we've been discussing, chapter 49 of the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 13, in a verse that most of us have taken to memory, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Ya ayyuhan nas, if I could just ask everyone to move forward. Because many people are trying to come in and it's distracting a little bit.
we see that in this verse of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unlike the verses that precede it, begins with a different tone. As we mentioned yesterday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the majority of their, these verses, begins by saying, Ya ayyuhal ladina, amanu. In this particular verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Ya ayyuhal nas. What's the difference? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other verses that precede it speak to only the believers. Ya ayyuhal ladina, amanu. O you who believe. In this particular verse of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Ya ayyuhal nas, O people. O people in general. O mankind. Which is why that if you go ahead and you take a look at the different mufassireen, the different exegetes of the Holy Quran, you will find that each and every one of them have a different explanation for this particular verse. Some of them will state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the other verses by saying, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe, because those verses were revealed in Medina. And while this verse was revealed in Mecca, what is the difference? If we take a look, that the first 10 years of the life of the prophethood of Rasulullah were in the holy city of Mecca. After that, we find that the last 13 years were in Medina. The difference between the verses of Meccan verses or Medani verses is the fact that Meccan verses, they speak to issues of aqa'id. Rasulullah comes to these idol worshippers and the things that he tries to preach to them are things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He preaches to them about the day of judgment and about believing in an afterlife. Other types of verses are about prophethood and the history of the previous prophets of Adam and Musa and Isa and so on and so forth. Also in Meccan verses, we see that verses were stressed in regards to basic humanity, actions, akhlaq and so on. We find that in Medani verses, the majority of them are in regards to legislation. Because now, Rasulullah has Muslims under him. That he's established a government and there's a certain etiquette in terms of dealing with the prophet dealing with the people, dealing with others, dealing with animals, dealing with non-Muslims, and so on and so forth. But other mufassireen say about this verse, no. That, uh, that this verse was not revealed in Mecca, but revealed in Medina, like all of the other verses in Surah Al-Hujra. But the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes the beginning of this verse to saying, Ya ayyuhal nas, because of the message that is within this particular verse of the Quran. Ya ayyuhal nas. That, oh people, we've created you into men and we've created you into women. That, oh people, we've created you into male and we've created you into female and we've placed you into nations and we've placed you into tribes in the idea that you come and you know each other. Many times when we take a look at the reasons of this revelation, we find that one group of scholars, they state that once there was a slave in the Islamic community who would always come and pray behind Rasulullah in his mosque in Medina. They stated that after a couple of days, Rasulullah began to notice that he was no longer coming. He inquired about him. They found out that he was sick. Rasulullah went to go and visit him. After a couple of visits, this particular slave, he had passed away. Those masters of this particular slave didn't care very much. Rasulullah came and it is said that he is the one who performed his ghusl. And he is the one who gave him the kafan. And he is the one who buried him. And he is the one who prayed upon him. When people, they came toward Rasulullah. Imagine the society. They came toward Rasulullah and they said, Oh Rasulullah, why do you give so much benefit to this man? He said, and, and this verse was revealed, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaknaakum min dhakarin wa unta. Another group of people say that this was revealed in honor of a man by the name of Juwayrib. Or other people say his name was Jurab. Or whatever it was. That this particular man was living in what is known, he was amongst the people of Ahlus Safa. Ahlus Safa, if you go toward Masjid al Nabawi today in the city of Medina, you find that after right behind where the, where the Holy Prophet is buried, there's a place which is called the place of the people of Safa. This place during the time of Rasulullah was the place where all of the poor people who had no money, who had no place to live, they would go and stay there. And Rasulullah out of the public treasury and out of his own wealth would be the ones to provide for them. He would give them food, give them wealth, give them clothes and everything like this. 
It is stated that one day Rasulullah went to, went to go and visit them and he would go and eat with them and he would go and speak with them all the time. Rasulullah went to one of them, this man by the name of Joyrib. He said, oh my companion, he said, you know, you're getting old, why don't you get married? He says, who is going to marry me? This particular Joyrib, he said that I come from African descent and I am very short and I am not the most attractive person that society determines me. Rasulullah says, and what is the matter? He says that I know a man, he is a noble man of Mecca, or sorry, a noble man of Medina. His name is Ziyad. You go to his house and you tell him I sent you and you are proposing for his daughter. No problem. He goes to this noble man of Medina. He knocks his door. The man is extremely wealthy. He enters and he says, I have come to you with a message from Rasulullah. He says, if you've, you are a servant of Rasulullah, then come inside my home. He comes into the home and he says, what message did Rasulullah send you? He, the man shyly, he says that, oh respected man Ziyad, I have come to propose to your daughter. He says, excuse me, do you know who I am? Do you know who you are? He says, I'm sorry, if you do not wish for this, then I will get up and leave. It is said that as he was leaving, he left and his daughter was behind a particular curtain or in the next room. She came out of the room and she said, oh father, why did you reject this proposal without even asking me? Imagine this type of problem that we have in our community all the time. By the way, just to quickly open up parentheses over here. It is haram, haram, for a father to reject a man without even mentioning it to his daughter, unless his daughter has given him that permission. Do you know how many problems filter into our communities over issues like this? Allahu Akbar, you have no idea. No idea. Anyhow, this lady, the daughter, she came out and she said, Oh father, why did you reject me? when he was from amongst the messengers, from amongst the believers, from amongst those who Rasulullah told me that I should marry. It is said that this man, he called this Jawaybar back, he came, toward, he came back towards Ziyad, and eventually Rasulullah recited there, Nikah. This man, this noble man of Mecca, he was a little bit worried, a little bit hesitant in the beginning, he went toward Rasulullah. At that moment, according to some traditions, Jibra'il came down toward Allah came down toward Rasulullah and said, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa unta and revealed this particular verse of the whole Qur'an. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We find that this idea of racism or prejudice is amongst the most important social, spiritual diseases within our community. As we mentioned yesterday, we went through some of those spiritual diseases which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions within Surah Al-Hujurat in verses 11 and 12. In this particular verse of the whole Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a different approach. After he states that, Ya ayyuhal nas, we have created you into men and into women and into nations and into tribes and into colors and into families and so on and so forth, he says that the way that you can solve this problem, لتعرفوا, that you should come forth and you should know one another. You should begin to inquire about one another. Differences are natural. Different languages, different cultures, different foods, different uh, clothing, whatever it is, these things are natural and these things are, are, are which should be embraced within our communities. Which is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses the word in this particular verse, لِتَعَرَفُ Coming from the word Arafa. Arafa in the Arabic language does not mean that you should just know each other by knowing, you know, that this person is from that particular country and I am from this particular country. Arafa in the Arabic language means concrete knowledge. Knowledge with the heart. Al-Iman ma'rafatu bil-qalb wal-ikraru bil-lisan wal-amal bil-arkan. Ma'rafa is with the heart. Knowing is with the heart. Thus when we talk about this particular verse of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you embrace one another. Do not marginalize one group from another group. Do not say that, these, that this mosque is for this group of people and not for this group of people. Do not say these type of things. Do not use this type of language. Do not push, for example, if someone wants to come and marry your daughter or you want to marry somebody, as soon as you find out that he's from this race, you say, no, it cannot happen. Where did this come from? We take a look and we find that throughout, Ahl, throughout the, life, the lives of the Ahlul Bayt, each and every one of them tried to break down these racial barriers. Each and every one of them. Number one, we go ahead and we see that the life of Rasulullah was full of this. We go ahead and we take a look at Salman. Salman, this great companion, 
of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wasalam. He is known as what? Salman al-Muhammadi. What do people call him these days? Salman al-Farsi. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, do not call him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad He says, do not call Salman, Salman the Persian. Call him Salman, call him Salman al-Muhammadi. In another occasion, we find that Salman one day was walking on the street. When one of the wealthy people of Medina, they came toward him. And they said, oh man, who are you? And he began to sing all of his titles. He said, I am this and I am that. I am this and I am that. Salman looked at him. He said, I am Salman al-Islam. I am Salman from Islam. What difference does it matter? And he continued to walk his way. You find, of course, the example of Bilal al-Habashi, which Rasulullah wasallam states that the sheen of Bilal is the sheen in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bilal could not say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. He would say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Rasulullah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows his intention regardless of whether he is eloquent in his language or not eloquent in his language. Then we go ahead and we take a look at other examples. We find that Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al kadhim Imam Ali al Rada, Imam Muhammad al Jawad, Imam al Hadi, each and every one of these Imams of Ahl al Bayt, who did they marry? They married women from Africa because in their particular community, what happened? They rejected people who were of darker complexion than them. Imams of the Ahl al Bayt, they came to break down this racial barrier. They came down to break these social barriers. Today we have created these same barriers that you cannot marry this person, that a Sayyid cannot marry a non Sayyid. A non Sayyid cannot marry a Sayyid. Where did this come from? Inna akramakum inna Allahi atqaqum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in this particular verse of the Holy Quran that the best amongst you are the ones who are pious, the ones who are God conscious. So where do we get this from? We find even on the day of Ashura, when we talk about breaking down all barriers, when we want to take any lesson in history, we go to Karbala. Look at Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. I'm salam from the Wallah Muhammad. He has a companion by the name of John. John is the slave of Abu Dhar al Ghaffari. John comes toward Aba Abdullah on the day of Ashura. He says, Oh Imam al Hussein, let me go out and fight. He says, I'm an extremely old man. I've dedicated myself toward you and your cause. But he said, Oh Aba Abdullah, that I am dark in complexion. And he said that I have a foul odor. I am full of sin. And he continues. Imam al Hussein says, Oh John, you do not go. You are free. You are a free man today. You are no longer a slave. At this moment, Imam al Hussein receives the call from John begging him to go and fight until Imam al Hussein says, Go ahead and fight. It is said that as he was fighting until his last, he called out, Assalamu alaikum, ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein ran toward John. He put his head in his lap. And then the tradition states that Imam al Hussein, he took his cheek and he put it on the cheek of John. John responds by saying what? He says, Men mithli. Men mithli. Who is like me? Hatta khadda ibn bint Rasulullah ala khaddi. Who is like me that the cheek of the son of the daughter of Rasulullah puts his cheek on my cheek? And if we go ahead and we take a look and we read history, we find that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he did this only on two occasions. The first occasion was for John, the slave of Abu Dhar al Ghaffar. The second one was for his own son, Ali al Akbar. Imam al Hussein doesn't make a difference between the black slave and his own son from the progeny of Rasulullah. Take a look at the example. Which is why we go ahead and we take a look at these spiritual diseases. They need to be removed from our own hearts. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And we find that the human being is inclined to being racist or inclined to being prejudiced because he himself has not perfected his inner self. As we have been mentioning over these nights as our theme, that in regards to creating a social revolution, in regards to creating a perfect fabric of society, we need to perfect our own selves. The human being is created of dust. He will return to dust. And cosmologists in the religion of Islam, they state that the human being, because of this nature of his, because of his bodily, corporeal nature, he always inclines toward dust. What do I mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called this earth, this world that we live on, the dunya. 
الدنيا الدنيا. This world, dunya, comes from the Arabic language, Arabic word, adana, meaning the lowest of the low. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the traditions of Ahlul Bayt speak about this world as the lowest of the low. And we are on this world and we aspire this world. We come from the dunya, we will return to the dunya, and we aspire the dunya. What do I mean? That the human being has bodily needs and bodily desires. But as we mentioned the other day, he also has spiritual needs and spiritual desires. His bodily desires take him to only seeing physical things. But his spiritual nature takes him towards spiritual insight of seeing spiritual things. Which is why when we take a look and we look, we look at other people, what do we, what's the thing that we see about them? We see that they are tall, they are short, they are fat, they are skinny, they are dark, they are light. They are all of these physical things. We have not attained what is known as al-basira, the spiritual insight within our own hearts to see the hearts of people. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after this particular verse in the Holy Quran, He speaks about a very important thing before I will conclude because I know that I am running over my time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after speaking about breaking down social boundaries amongst one another, He says that the one who has perfected this concept of perfecting his soul of these spiritual diseases, He is the one who has attained Iman. A group of people come toward Rasulullah. وَقَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا A group of Bedouins, they come toward Rasulullah. They come toward him and they say, Oh Rasulullah, we have submitted to your religion. Rasulullah says, by the command of the Qur'an, do not say that you are amongst the believers. They say, Amenna. We, we, we are mu'min, they're telling Rasulullah. We are mu'min. Rasulullah says, do not... Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala. Do not say that you believe, but rather just say that you submit. Do not say that you're a mu'min. Say you're a Muslim. Say that I'm a submitter. I'm not one who has true belief. Why? Because belief comes from the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran. Then in the next verse, verse number 15. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولَهِ do not say you are believers. Why? Because the believers, they submit and they have faith in Allah. And in the Messenger, This is the important line. Do not say that you are believers. Because believers are the ones who believe in Allah. And their Messenger, and they are the ones who give out of their wealth and out of their selves. What do we say in the ziyarah? Assalamu alayka ayyuhal abdus salih al muti'u lillah wa li rasulih. Assalamu alayka ayyuhal abdul fadl abbas. Only one line defines the character of Abdul fadl al abbas. We say, peace be upon you, O pious slave, the one who obeyed Allah and his messenger. That's it. What else do you need to know about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? And I swear to God, many people, they come to me often and they state, you know, why do we have this special night for Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? where the people, they come to the mosque, the same gathering that we find on the night of Ashura. Why are they, why are they not there on the other nights? Why does Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas have his own shrine in the plains of Karbara? Why? You think that this is a coincidence? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to honor Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas for all of centuries and all of generations. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas wa ma adrakim al-Abbas. And what? Do we know about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? We go ahead and we take a look that when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was born in the, in the holy Kaaba, what do we find? What do traditions tell us? They state that Amir al-Mu'mineen was in the hands of Fatima bint Asad, yes, his mother, for three days. She did not leave for three days. 
And Amir al-Mu'mineen had his eyes closed for three days and he did not take any food from his mother. Until what? Until the Kaaba opened back up, Fatima bint al-Asad walked out, Amir al-Mu'mineen was given into the hands of Rasulullah. Rasulullah looked at Amir al-Mu'mineen, Amir al-Mu'mineen opened up his eyes, the first sight that he saw was the face of Rasulullah. At that moment, Rasulullah took a little bit of his saliva and put it into the saliva of Amir al-Mu'mineen. We see Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas born to his mother Umm al-Baneen. When Umm al-Baneen gives birth to him, al-Abbas doesn't open his eyes, doesn't take any food from his mother until he is put into the hands of Aba Abdullah. At that moment, he looks, the first sight that he sees is the face of Imam al Hussein, And the first thing that he takes in his mouth is the saliva of Aba Abdullah. Number one. Number two, we find that when Umm al-Baneen was pregnant with al-Abbas, Every single time, Imam al Hussein would walk into the house and would greet his mother, his stepmother, Umm al Banin. Every single time, Umm al Banin would stand up. She would stand up. Imam al Hussein, this is a young boy. He says, Oh, my mother. He says, You are pregnant. There's no need for you to stand up. Every single time I walk into the room, you don't have to do this. Umm al Banin says, Oh, Abba Abdullah, I wish I could sit down. But every single time you walk into the room, Al-Abbas begins to kick me until I stand up. Then at that moment, then he stops. <clears throat> we find Al-Abbas at 14 years old was his first military exposure. In the battle of Safin, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he goes and it is stated that Imam Amir al muminin he sends Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to go and fight. And it's said that as he's about to go and fight, he begins to kill, and he begins to fight, and he comes back for a breather, he comes back for a break. Amongst those in the army of Amir al muminin were a man by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, the killer of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is said that he goes toward Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, and he says, Oh Abbas, he said, did you notice that your father he sent you instead of Hassan and Hussein. He sent you to go and fight because he wants you to be killed and not Hassan and Hussein. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is a young boy. It is said that he goes toward his father, Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he says, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, oh, my father, why the, 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 some of your companions, some of your people are saying that you want me to be killed. You, do not, you, you want to protect Hassan and Hussein. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, oh, Abbas, Hassan and Hussein are the sons of Rasulullah and you are my son, oh, Abbas. And it said that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas on that day, he went and he began to pierce through the army in the same way that his father did. But an agreement was made between Muawiyah and Amir al-Mu'mineen prior to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas engaging in this battle. This agreement was that on that particular day, Amir al-Mu'mineen would not fight anymore because Ali ibn Abi Talib would just pierce through that army and no one could stop him. So that he said, no problem, I will decorate Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas in my own clothes and I will let him go and fight. Eventually, as Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was piercing through the army of Muawiyah, it is said that at this moment, some of those in Muawiyah's camp, they begin to call out, Ali is a liar, Ali is a cheater. At this moment, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he came outside of the tent. He says, oh, my son, come back toward me. He was covered in a mask. It is said that Amir al-Mu'mineen removed the mask from the face of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, and he says, this is not me, this is not Amir al-Mu'mineen, this is not Ali, but this is Qamr bani Hashim, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Wow. It is said that in the same battle of Safin, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Imam al hussein excuse me, Imam al hussein was told by his father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, to go and catch the riverbank Euphrates. He was told, you go and you capture, you fight this particular group, and you get to the water. You get to the water. It is said that Imam al hussein alayhi salam, got on top of his horse, and it began riding closer and closer toward the Euphrates, when all of a sudden Imam al Hussein began to hear footsteps from behind him. He took out his sword and he turned around and who did he see? He saw Abu al Fadl al Abbas running and jogging after him. Imam al Hussein says, Oh, my brother, why are you running after me? Why are you chasing after me? My father sent me to go and catch the riverbank. He also, uh, Abu al Fadl al Abbas says that, oh, oh, I mean, oh, oh, Abu Abdullah, that my father also said that I am your slave and I am your servant and I can never leave you. Who? is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Can we explain him in words? 
who do we compare him to? We don't compare him to regular companions of Imam al Hussein. We don't compare him to regular companions of Amir al Mu'mineen. We compare him to prophets and we compare him to the greatest of people to ever step foot on this earth. That is who Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is. Why? Because Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas manifested the truth of servanthood, of slavery to his master, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. It is stated, look at this line. If you want to know who is Abbas, then look at his words. It is stated that when Imam al Hussein والسلام's caravan was leaving from Mecca, after they left Medina, they went to Mecca. From Mecca, they were supposed to go toward Kufa. Of course, they ended up in Karbara. It is said that on the day that they were leaving Mecca, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas gathered in Masjid al-Haram. Each and every one of those who were there to perform the Hajj. It is, it is said that he stood up on a high plateau. He stood up on a high ground. And he began to say these words. And if you want to know Abbas, then look at these words. He says that I begin in the name of Allah. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of this Kaaba. Listen. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of this Kaaba, which was sanctified and which was glorified when the father of my master was born inside of it. What was the Kaaba? What was morals? What was virtues without Ali ibn Abi Talib? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, then he states, he says, and now you wish to go before you try to kill Rasulullah. Then you killed Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then you killed Fatima. You killed Hassan. And now you wish to kill Hussein. I swear to God, no one will kill Hussein if I am alive. Who is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? Can we explain him? Allahu Akbar, the day of Ashura. On the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein والسلام, is lonely on the plains. Abu al Fadl al Abbas comes toward him. Allahu Akbar. Abu al Fadl al Abbas he comes toward his master, Imam al Hussein, and he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, let me go and fight now. Imam al Hussein says, Absolutely not. He says, Oh Abbas, you are the flag bearer on this day. If you, I don't have you and the flag is no longer standing, then there's no army. But Aba Abdullah, where was your army on that moment? There was no more army. It is said that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he begins to plead with Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein says, no, absolutely not. But he says that if you wish to go and if you wish to desire to do something, then I hear the calls of the children calling out, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. We are thirsty, we are thirsty. Oh, Abbas, go ahead and bring them water if that's what you want to do. It is said that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, alayhi salam, he got on top of his horse. Imam al Hussein did not allow him to go with the sword. He allowed him to only go with the spear and the jug of water according to some narrations. It is said that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, alayhi salam, he got on top of the horse and he was riding closer and closer to the, toward the Euphrates. Umar ibn Sa'd, he sent down a contingent of 4,000 men to go and shower, shower arrows on the body of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. It is said that al-Abbas, when he was coming and moving toward the Euphrates, they began to call out that this is the son of Ali. This is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And tradition state and narration say, states that when Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was going through those 4,000 archers, they parted, they parted like, the, like, like the water parted from Musa. And it is said that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he reaches toward the river Euphrates. He picks up a little bit of water. What happens at this moment? Some people state that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas wanted to drink from that water. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The tradition states that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he picked up the water. He took the water and he splashed it on top. And it is said that he got back onto his horse and he was riding back calling out, Ya nafs min ba'dil Hussein huni. وَبَعْدَهُ لَا كُنْتِ يَنْتَكُونِي هَذَا الْحُسَيْنُ شَارِبَ الْمَنُونِ وَتَشْرَبِينَ الْبَارِدِ الْمَعِينِ 
Wallahu haba ma fa'alu dini. Oh, oh Allah, how can I drink water? Oh, my own self, how can I drink water when Aba Abdullah is thirsty? It is said that at this moment, Imam Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was moving closer and closer back toward the camp of Aba Abdullah. Zainab is standing on the hill. Sukaina is on her shoulders. She is saying, I hear my uncle Abbas. I see the flag moving toward us. At this moment, a man came from behind the palm tree and he struck the right arm of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Abbas, he called out, Wallahi, Wallahi, in qata'atum yameeni, in uhami abadan andini. No matter if you come and you strike my right arm, I will continue to move toward Aba Abdullah. It is said that Sukaina is standing, she is on the shoulders of Zainab. She's saying, Oh my aunt Zainab, I saw the flag move from the right to the left. At that moment, all of a sudden, another man came and he struck Abu al Fadl al Abbas on the left hand. It is said that at this moment, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he tried to contain the warner. He tried to contain the flag. He tried to contain himself. He began to shake all of a sudden. At this moment, <laughs> at this moment, all of a sudden, a man came, Hormara ibn Kahil. He took an arrow and he shot it into the right eye of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. It is said that he tried to remove the arrow, but he didn't have any hands. It is said that he looked down and he tried to remove the arrow with his knees. When he put his head down, the helmet fell. A man came with the iron rod, Allahu Akbar. He came and he struck that of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He calls out, As-salamu alayk, Ya Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah, Imam al Hussein. He moving toward Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. All of a sudden, the horse stops. He says, oh horse, why are you stopping? But he looks down and he sees the right arm of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He moves forward continuously and the horse stops again. He says, oh horse, why do you stop? He says, I stop because I see the left arm of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. It is said that he goes toward Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Allahu Akbar. He goes toward him. He puts his head on top of his lap. He begins to console him. And you know what happened. We will leave that discussion for the day of Ashura. And the night of Ashura, we go ahead and we see that Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam, after he leaves the body of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas next to the Euphrates, he comes back toward the camp. Zainab and Sukaina and Ruqayya, they all come and they say, where is our uncle al-Abbas? It is said that at that moment, Imam al Hussein he goes and he takes the tent and he removes the pillar of the tent and the entire tent fell and he says, that's what happened to al-Abbas. <laughs> सीने में जब तक है भूलेगा ना गम तेरा आ देख मेरे गाजी ऊंचा है आलम तेरा आ देख मेरे गाजी زینب کی دعا بن کر ایک وقت وہ آئے گا ہر 
جاتی ہے زہرا بھی زینب کی زیارت کو جب آتھ محرم کو اٹھتا ہے علم تیرا دل سینے میں جب تک ہے بولے گا نہ غم تیرا آ دیکھ میرے غازی چاہے علم تیرا آ دیکھ میرے غازی اونچا ہے علم تیرا تابوت جب اٹھتا ہے شبیر کا اے غازی تابوت کے آگے بھی چلتا ہے علم تیرا دل سینے میں جب تک ہے بھولے گا نہ غم تیرا آ دیکھ میرے غازی اونچا ہے علم تیرا آ دیکھ میرے غازی اونچا ہے وہ کون سے صدمے تھے شے ٹوٹ گئے جسے ایک دردت زینب کا اور دوسرا غم تیرا دل سینے میں جب تک ہے بھولے گا نہ غم تیرا دیکھ میرے غازی اونچا ہے علم تیرا دیکھ میرے غازی اونچا ہے علم تیرا جب بہ گیا سب پانی تب آس تیری ٹوٹی سین کے اندر یا مشتی زمیں دم تیرا دل سین میں جب تک ہے بھولے گا نہ غم تیرا آ دیکھ میرے غازی اونچا ہے علم تیرا آ دیکھ میرے غازی Uh, a few announcements. So on Ashura will be on Thursday. The program will begin at 10 a.m. There will be a parallel program in English in the basement for uh, the youth or anyone else who wants to join. Uh, it, and it will conclude with an English majlis before the Urdu program upstairs. Um, the we have 27 people who have signed up for the blood drive, but we are looking for more volunteers. So please fill out the sheet outside. Right now, tentatively, uh, we're scheduling it for December 1st. Um, and then the final announcement is that there's actually a youth, a, 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 um, a program for uh, children between the ages of three and six, which happens upstairs in the back classroom. So if you have children who want to participate in that, um, they can do so. Uh, Ziarat. Surah Allah. 
السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين يا علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك يا حسين ابن علي المجتبى السلام عليك يا حسين ابن علي الشهيد بكربلاء السلام عليك يا علي ابن الحسين يا زين الآبدين السلام عليك يا محمد ابن علي الباقر السلام عليك يا جعفر ابن محمد الصادق السلام عليك يا موسى ابن جعفر الكاذب السلام عليك علي يا علي ابن موسى الرضا السلام عليك يا محمد ابن الجواد علي الجواد السلام عليك يا علي ابن محمد الهادي السلام عليك يا حسن ابن علي العسكري السلام عليك يا خجت ابن الحسن يا صاحب الزمان السلام عليك يا السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا إمام الإنس والجن ورحمة ورحمة الله وبركاته Also, there is a Q&A that's going to commence.